buenos días a todos, a los que tenemos acá presentes en el anfiteatro de Iña Las Brujas, pero también este, a, a, a los que nos están siguiendo vía, vía el streaming, por lo que nos decían, ya había conectado 30 o 40 personas más. Este, mi nombre es Álvaro Roel, para los que no me conocen, eh, y actualmente soy investigador principal del programa de investigación de arroz y también del programa de sustentabilidad ambiental. Eh, lamentablemente, José Paruelo, nuestro gerente de investigación, por un, por una, por, tiene agendada una cita médica y no va a poder estar este, haciendo la apertura de este taller, tampoco Nora Altie, que está, que está de licencia, así que me tocó a mí hacer esta, esta, esta breve introducción para después pasar realmente a la, a la esencia del taller. Quienes me acompañan aquí, eh, a, la, a mi derecha, a la izquierda de ustedes, el doctor Willem Berfurt, de la Universidad de Sydney. Ya voy a, voy a explicar un poco qué es lo que está haciendo él con nosotros. Y a mi izquierda, a la derecha de ustedes, al ingeniero Marco, Marco Dalarriza, investigador de la unidad de biotecnología, coordinador de esta unidad, pero... Hoy, hoy está acá en, en carácter de editor en jefe de, de la revista científica que tenemos en conjunto con Facultad de Agronomía, la revista Agrociencias. Eh, el doctor eh, Willem Berfurt eh, ha trabajado ya, viene trabajando en Uruguay hace dos o tres años, especialmente en, en la parte de... De, de educación, dictando cursos, formando investigadores y formando eh, profesores en el área de modelación hidrológica. Y en, y en este año en particular, eh, en una de las acciones de, de lo que es fortalecer el grupo de recursos hídricos dentro de línea, eh, tenemos un acuerdo de trabajo que está interaccionando con el acuerdo que tenemos con el Instituto IRI de la Universidad de, de Columbia, que nos permite, digamos, avanzar en esta temática dentro de línea de modelación hidrológica. Por lo tanto, tenemos la suerte de tener a, a Willem este, en actividades dos veces al año, por periodos de dos semanas, y cuando estábamos planificando la, la agenda de, de, este, de este año, junto con, junto con el grupo, eh, Willem nos, nos hacía llegar la reflexión que, que le parecía, digamos, interesante desde su carácter, digamos, de, de profesor y con una experiencia muy vasta, como tienen en, en, el, en, el, en el flyer de este, de este taller en, en, en publicaciones científicas, pero además por ser eh, miembro de un consejo editorial, de un journal, eh, digamos, de la, de, del Xavier, particularmente de Environmental Modeling and Software, de poder, digamos, ayudar en, 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 en comentar, digamos, su, su experiencia en lo que es, digamos, la, el desafío de, de, de avanzar en, la, en, las publicaciones, en las publicaciones científicas. Así que cuando le comentamos esto a Paruelo y específicamente a, a Nora Altier, le pareció muy interesante hacer este, este taller. Este, y también, este, conversando, digamos, con Marco, nos parecía también este, que era una buena oportunidad para comentarle, digamos, a a ustedes y a los que estén interesando, interesados de los avances que se, los avances y las modificaciones este, que se están haciendo que se están haciendo en la, en la revista Agrociencias. Así que la actividad de hoy va a consistir en dos partes. Una primera parte, digamos, la, la, presentación de, la presentación de Willem, redacción de artículos científicos, consejo de un, de un editor para aumentar la posibilidad de aceptación de revistas arbitradas, Willem, muy similar a lo de Marco, está en, en, en una posición que recibe los papers y los manda a revisores y después es el que te, tiene que terminar este, laudando entre la opinión de los revisores y aconsejando al, al jefe editor si el, si, el, si el artículo pasa a publicación o no. O sea que creo que va a ser bien interesante los tips y los consejos que él nos pueda dar. Y de la misma forma, digamos, por parte de por parte de Marco en la, en, la revista, en la revista Agrociencias. Originalmente lo pensábamos hacer solamente por videoconferencia, 
este, capaz que eso facilitaba un poco la interacción, pero después había mucha gente interesada de otras de otra, de otra instituciones fuera de Iña y en particular cuando este, introdujimos la parte de agrociencias en, en, en Facultad de Agronomía, así que bueno, laudamos por hacerlo este, en forma paralela a través de, a través de streaming eh, y por lo tanto tal vez eso dificulte un poco digamos este, la, la interacción, pero desde, ayer, desde ya le adelantamos que Willem va a estar con nosotros a lo largo de esta semana y la semana que viene y si alguien en particular acá en el salón o que nos está siguiendo tiene interés en conversar con él, por supuesto que podemos hacer un lugar, digamos, en la agenda para que eso para que eso ocurra. Y bueno, y en el caso de Marco, digamos, es, es bien conocido por todos y está acá en las brujas, también, también siempre hay oportunidad para poder avanzar en, en, en las reflexiones que él nos deje. Así que no creo que con esto es suficiente la introducción y le pasaríamos entonces ahora... A, a Willem para que, para que arranque, digamos, su, su, su presentación. La idea es que Willem nos dé una presentación a, a, alrededor de 40 minutos, después vemos si hay alguna pregunta a nivel local para luego, este, digamos, finalizar con la, con la exposición de Marco Dalariz. Ok, Willem, si quieres empezar. So, uh, this uh, will be in English because even though I've been to Uruguay now for two years, I still don't speak enough Spanish. Sorry. Okay, so I, uh, I thought it would be good to share some of my learning or some of the things that I've learned in the past and that I, uh, from publishing in journals and how you might uh, improve your chances of getting published. And um, that partly comes through my um, experience as a as a uh, edit or as an associate or a editor or being on the editorial board for the um, uh, environmental modeling and software journal so um, yeah so I'll go in straight into it so just to, to highlight that so the the environmental modeling and software journal has an editor-in-chief that's Dan Ames and then below him sit a set of associate editors And then below that sits the editorial board where I'm part of the editorial board. So I'm not yet at the top. Maybe I'll get there later. Okay, so if a paper comes in, someone submits a paper, it gets assigned to an associate editor. And so the associate editor then decides who on the editorial board is the best person to handle that paper. To, who, so they're looking for someone who's got knowledge in the field and they're looking for someone who's got, who has access to a set of reviewers that might be able to, to use that. So then it gets assigned to me uh, in this case, and then I go out and I find three reviewers. Now that's, that's a, uh, Marco can com probably comment on that too, that's actually a, quite a difficult process in that it uh, becomes harder and harder to find good reviewers, and it becomes harder and harder to actually find them reviewers who send in their reviews in time or accept the review invitation in time. So I will have a plug for doing review jobs later, but it's, um, it's, it's an important part of the process because in the end, scientific, the scientific process relies on that we review and provide feedback to each other about the uh, quality of our work and, that we, and that's a, an important step. Peer review is an important step in how we do research. And that's a lot of discussion about peer review and how we do peer review and whether we do it well at the moment. So there's a, there's a whole, we can give a whole lot of workshop on peer review, but um, I just want to mention that there is a lot of things happening there. So once that happens, I get the replies from the reviewers. I also might look at that and possibly provide an additional review. So if the reviewers disagree or if I think that the reviewers haven't done a good job, Or if I can't find three reviewers, then I might, as an, as an editorial board member, provide an additional review in the, in the area. And then finally, I will send an email to the editor-in-chief with advice on what I think should happen with that paper, whether it should get accepted or rejected or reviews or things like that. And then the editor-in-chief will then uh, communicate that decision to the author. So that's kind of the process, how it works in most journals. That's how the steps, uh, and so there's several steps in there. And that is one of the reasons why it takes a little time before you um, uh, get your paper back. And also, this is all a volunteer process, right? None of us gets paid for this. 
So we all do this in our, on our whatever spare time we think we have. And we all know how much spare time we have. Right, so let's get into then the other question. So what journal should you choose? So that's the, probably the first question to answer. And it is quite important. It's quite an important uh, choice. So the, the, the first thing to look at is what the scope of the journal is, right? So there is a, each journal provides a scope, and I'll just see if I can do this. So we, um, I think I've just been shown how to do this. No, that's wrong. I'll see how we can do that. I think I need to move this here. Yes. So here is environmental modeling and software, and I'll see if I can increase this. Right, so, and it, it describes in here what it actually is looking for, right? So in, in the actual um, journal, on every, almost every journal website, there will be a discussion on what the scope is, what kind of papers they're looking for, Environmental software and modeling and software is actually at the moment rewriting their scope, but that's a different thing. But in general, there is a scope. There is always a, um, a description of the scope, and that's what you should pay good attention to that before you submit a paper. So don't submit a paper to a journal because you like the name or something like that. You really need to look at what the scope is and whether your paper fits into that scope. That's the biggest mistake that most people make, and a lot of people get paper get rejected by the associate editor already because it doesn't fit the scope. Okay, so let's see if I can bring this back and get rid of this. All right, so back to that one. Okay, then there are two publishing models these days. Um, the traditional publishing model is that there's a big company that provides, publishes a journal like Elsevier or um, uh, Springer and um, libraries buy subscriptions or people buy subscriptions to that journal and that funds the journal, right? The, the money from the subscription pays for the publishing and as an author you basically submit your paper and it's free, right? You don't have to pay anything. So in, because the subscriptions pay for the, um, uh, the journal. Now the problem is that of course more and more journals are now accessible via the internet or open or, and so the subscriptions have really, the, the money coming in from the subscriptions has really declined and there's not as much money coming into that and it, that publishing model is really struggling. And so the second publishing model that's been working, people have been working with is open access, where you as an author pay, but then your paper is openly accessible for anyone, not via subscription, but anyone can read it. So there's a, there's a real, um, there are real advantages to that, that it means that you, you suddenly have a lot more chance of someone actually reading your paper and maybe citing your paper and maybe using your paper, but the disadvantage of it is that you actually have to pay for the thing, the, the publication. And that can be difficult, especially when the costs are high. For example, I think for my journal at the moment, the open access costs are about 3000 to $3,500, I think, something like that, so it's quite high. In fact, We've just heard that the Elsevier, the model in Elsevier is that um, the higher impact factor of your journal, the higher cost of the open access publishing, which I find interesting, an interesting uh, rule that they play with. Um, so, you know, the cost of open access publishing is, is something that you, the organization, for example, INIA, who supports you, uh, can think about whether they would help you support, help pay for that or whether that is something that you have to find in your own research budget. University of Sydney at the moment, we have to find that money in our own research budgets, which is not very encouraging to do, use open access publishing. There is, however, a website, this website um, that I've learned about quite recently, that um, has actually a list of all the open access journals and their costs. So I'll just try and show that one again. Let's see if I can do this. This is a, a tricky thing. There we go. Right. So this is directory of open access journals, and you can actually find in there uh, any you know uh, journals and their costs. So if I, for example, type in hydrology then it 
takes a little time. Then it should search through the database and come up with, hopefully, mm, while I keep talking. Oh, oh, well, okay, I'll try that later. <laughs> well, <laughs> Uh, someone else can try that themselves later. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Well, we can try that later. It doesn't really matter. Okay, let me try and move this back out of the way. Right. So that's one thing is looking at uh, open access and uh, looking at the cost of open access. But basically, it can range from as little as 300 Swiss francs or 300 euros all the way up to something like three or $4,000. So there's quite, quite a big range in terms of publication costs. And that's something you can consider. Now, there is, of course, a trade-off, again, in terms of um, the, uh, the open access costs and the impact. So because the open access, so the open access publishing is quite interesting. So you as an author pay to get your paper published. So if you pay that money, you would expect almost that you're going to get published. And also, if I'm the journal, What's my, how's my business model working? My business model is working, the more papers I get published, the more papers I accept, the more money I get, right? So this has given rise to an enormous amount of journals that you probably get invitations from all the time on your email from a, different ra a range of different countries who all tell you that you should publish in their journal and their open access, and if you pay the fee, then they will you know, publish your journal and your paper. You have to keep an eye out on whether that journal is actually useful for you and whether that journal actually means that your paper will get read. Because in the end, you don't want your paper to sit next to a low quality paper from someone else. You want your paper to sit next to a high quality paper from someone else, right? That's really what you want. So, you know, looking at the review process and looking at how they review it, who is on the editorial board of that journal, whether there are people on the editorial board that are in your field, whether there are people that are in the editorial board that you know that are higher up in your field, that can all be useful to go and look at. Um, reading a few other papers in that journal might be useful before you decide to go and publish in that journal. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't publish in an open access, low impact fa factor journal. It might be the journal of the future. You just don't know. Right? It's more important that you check what are the other papers in there and is it something uh, you want to publish in. I'm planning to publish in a couple of new journals that I've identified that I find interesting and I just think that they, you should, I, I should be supporting those journals so I'll try and put some open access papers in those. So you know, just focusing only on impact factor is not um, that useful. So there is a thing that's the impact factor, right? And this is something that a lot of research organizations look at. For example, the university will require me to, um, to, or they don't require me, but they expect me to, to publish in journals which have high impact factors. And the impact factor, if you don't know what that is, that is explained on this, um, this website, Clarivate, who have actually designed that impact factor, right? So they're actually, um, Right, so here actually says um, the impact factor is one of these. It measures the frequency with which the average article in a journal has been cited in a particular year of per or period, right? The annual, GAC, the annual impact factor is the ratio between citations and recent citable items published. Does the impact factor of a journal is calculated by the dividing number of current year citations or to the source items published in the journal? So, again, if I publish fewer papers in my journal, I accept fewer papers, then that bottom of the ratio will go down, and that means my impact factor will go up, right? So there's all kinds of ways of gaming the impact factor. And as a journal, you're looking at those things as well. You're trying to work out, you know, how do you manage your impact factor and where do, you, where do you want your impact factor to be. So again, if we go back to environmental modeling and software, we have an impact factor at the moment of 4.1, right? And um, that actually has been dropping slightly because we're actually accepting too many papers. So, you know, it's one of those things which we, so, you know, there is, a, you know, in one way, so our rejection rate is quite high. It's probably around 70%, but a lot of those get rejected at the associate editor level, basically because they're not in scope or just because they're, 
they're just not as suitable at all to the journal. Okay, all right. Let's go back to these, this one. Okay, so there are different ways of reviewing. Uh, some people do double blind. That means you don't know when you get the paper as a reviewer, you don't know who wrote it. Uh, you just see the paper, you don't actually see any names. Blind, which means you just, you know, know the names on the paper. That's what EMS uses and what most Elsevier journal uses. And totally open review, which is HES, uh, Hydrology and Earth System Sciences, which is quite interesting. And actually, there's now a movement in the, um, in the scientific world to actually sign all your reviews. You should actually put your name on all your reviews. So there's a big debate on whether you should put your name on your review or not. Um, I like putting my name on a review because I think if I can't put my name on it, if I can't be open about what I think, then the review pro process is also failing, right? So I should be able to be stand behind my review and say, this is what I believe is about your paper. If you don't like that, well, that's, I'm sorry about that. That's just my opinion on this, right? So there is a movement towards that. So it's worth uh, looking at those different ways of how people review and what that uh, brings to it. Okay, English. So English is a bit of a, an issue, of course. So the main language of publication in scientific publication is still in English. And English is really, um, and, and that can be quite difficult for uh, when you're a non-native English speaker, even including myself. Uh, the first thing I had to learn that there is a thing called US English versus British English. And those two things are quite different. And particularly now being in Australia, I have to revert back to a lot of British English. So depending on where your journal is being published, if you're pu publishing in one of the CSIRO journals in Australia, the editor or you should be expected to, to write in British English rather than in US English. If you're publishing in any of the US journals, you're expected to write in US English. There's a famous soil journal out of European Journal of Soil Science. There is a, uh, uh, a person there who is a retired academic who loves to use his red pen to try and correct your English into <laughs> British English. So it's, uh, it's, it's something you have to keep in mind. But that's, that's a minor thing. The real key thing about English is that English is a very concise and direct language relative to um, many other languages. And this is one of the things that a lot of, um, when I read articles, a lot of things that are correct are about how you write more concise. And even with my students, that's what you need to work on, is, is, is what I need to work on is how do you write simple and short sentences. For people from, with a Spanish background, that is difficult. Right? And so, and not all published papers are good examples of how you write good and concise English. Right? So there's a lot of papers that are published that actually are not very good. And so you have to really look at that because sometimes it can be really important because sometimes your paper doesn't get published because I don't understand what you're talking about. So here's an example from a paper from uh, which I got to review and the poor people, I mean, these people in Kazakhstan, they're probably trying really, really hard, and I've really tried to help them by giving them good advice, but at some point, I can't actually understand what they're saying there, right? And I have no idea what they're actually trying to show me and what they're actually talking about. So that's why I, my next point is, maybe it is important for Inya to consider whether they need to employ someone who is an English editor to help everybody to write better English into me. And that doesn't mean that that person is going to rewrite all your articles. No, it's trying to do training workshops and trying to help people to write better English. And, and that's just to try improve the publication, uh, the chance of publication. If the paper is written in good English, you have a much better chance of getting published because otherwise the editor will, you know, reject it based on that or the associate editor will basically reject it based on that. So another uh, type of English that I see a lot is, um, uh, South Asia or uh, Indian English and that is also quite flowery and quite lengthy and quite long and also I have to do a lot of work with those students to try and reduce their English to be more concise and be simpler right so it is quite direct and quite concise it's quite interesting so that's something to consider all right then so once you've got your journal you've got your in you think you've got your English into uh, organized then what, when and what to publish. You know, I, uh, this is another really big thing that, that, that is important that, that you need to consider is, is your paper, does your paper really have some global significance? If you're publishing in a big journal, in a journal that has global reach, you need to, your paper needs to have global significance. It can't just be 
uh, an, ist an issue that is important for Uruguay. It has to be an important an issue that is important for Latin America or important for um, the Southern Hemisphere. It, it has to be more than just your local issue. And you need to make sure that you describe really well why it is important that other people learn about your research. That it's not just this is important for the growers in, in uh, horticulture or the apple growers in, 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 in Uruguay. That's not, that's not a significant paper. That's not going to get published in an international journal. So you need to identify what actually is interesting in your research. That doesn't mean that you can't have a local case study, that you can't use a local, stu local study to demonstrate a larger global issue. It's just it has to be very clear that this is something that is, that is unclear, that is important for the rest of the research world to learn about. Then the other two things that are important to think about is whether you're describing a methodology or whether you're describing new findings. Right? So one, there are two different ways of doing this. One is you describe a paper where we, you develop a new way of actually measuring something or a new way of actually calculating something or a new way of observing something. That's a methodology paper. The other one is you actually talk about some novel finding or novel observations or novel measurements. So you're actually talking about what you found. The other one is how you did it. And those are two different reasons to publish. And there can be good reasons. But you need to be also very clear in your paper what it is that you're actually doing and that you're not trying to do both or, you know, it has to be a kind of a way to do it. And then finally, is really it's important to say what the context is, why and where and when is this interesting. So why is this, this specific thing that you've done, why is that interesting? Where is it interesting? Is it, not to, is it interesting in Latin America or is it interesting, you know, across the Southern Hemisphere? And is it interesting now because now is important to, or will it be interesting in the future or, will it, or is it interesting uh, over a certain time period, a limited time period? So you have to think about that a bit more too. And describing that well is really, really important and also that links then to where you should publish this, right? So there are different journals that might take different articles about that. There's a lot of new work going on in terms of publishing methods. So methodology, there's a whole range of new journals that are actually focused purely on methodology. And so also there is now a whole new set of journals that focus purely on publishing data. And that's a whole different story. I can, again, I can give a whole seminar just on that. All right, abstract. Abstract and title. It's good to have an informative and attractive title, right? So don't make it very long, keep it short, but also make sure that it's informative and it's kind of attractive. You know, an, investiga an investigation into is not a very good title, right? Um, also, then, the structure of the abstract. What to include and what to leave out. Does everybody know how to do a, an abstract well, right? Two sentences of introduction. One sentence for the aim and objectives. Two sentences for the methods. Two sentences for the results. One sentence for the conclusions. That's about it. That's all you need, right? You don't need that, need more. So, you know, you can look at this abstract and you can say, is that a good abstract? It only talks about the results, right? And it doesn't really outline very well why this, uh, uh, the reason why I didn't like this one is because it doesn't really outline very well why this, why this is needed. You know, we were just saying that it's important with a global significance. This doesn't really say, tell me whether this paper has any global significance, why this is important. Right? So it's something to think about. I'm happy to share this presentation later so we can, you know, can put up. Okay. So um, the importance of the introduction, I can't ha stress enough that it's really the introduction and the objectives and the hypothesis that set the tone for the article. If you don't get do that right, your article doesn't have much of a chance, right? So if the introduction is too long, it keeps talking about things, it doesn't summarize well, it doesn't, it's, it's how to write a good review within your introduction is really, really important. So writing a concise and good review of the existing research in two pages is really what you want to do. Two pages, 
submitted, you know, on a submitted paper. So not not two pages in the actual original in the actual article. It should only be one in your actual article, right? So it needs to be very clear. Why do we need this study? Why do we need this paper? What is it that you're telling me? What's new? What's important? So you need to do your research. Are you really presenting something new? I just want to show this one. These are my comments on uh, a paper that I reviewed. So this article curiously, curiously classified as a review article because they were actually presenting research. Present the development of a standardized groundwater index as a way to characterize groundwater deviations from the long-term mean similar to standard, etc. It's demonstrated, so it's actually a research paper, not a review paper, but anyway, they call it a review paper. And then I reject it. The key problem is that this is not a new idea, and this has been published, and I'm afraid much more thoroughly and better, by Bloomfield and Marshall in 2013. So clearly this author didn't do their background research or were trying to publish something that they knew that was published before. I don't know. I just basically, I did what, so what I do as a reviewer, I do a simple Google search on your uh, search to, on your keywords and if in Google Scholar and if something pops up, then I'll have a look at it at the abstract and if it seems similar, then I'll mention it, All right? So in this case, this paper was about identical to what the guy had done. And it, or it actually had it done much better. So it's something to just remember that, you know, you need to make sure that your paper is actually, is actually, uh, um, has to actually be novel and it has to be, can't be just someone else has already done it. All right, so you need to make sure it's something new. So do your research. So how does your work improve the existing results? You need to be able to summarize why is your paper better? What is it doing differently from the existing? You can't just say we're repeating someone else's work. I see it a lot from a lot of papers coming out of China where basically, essentially what they're doing is basically repeating what someone else has already done. And they're saying, and here's some results from China that repeat this research. Well, to me, that's not, an, that's not novel. That's not something that I would publish, right? Because you're just repeating it unless you're finding something totally different or you're finding something that contrasts or that is, you know, why this is new or why you think the other ones haven't done their work correctly or whether you think it should be improved on, then it's interesting. Just adding to the data, to me, is not that interesting for publication. So I wouldn't do that, wouldn't uh, uh, publish that. The other one, you, when you write an objective or an introduction, you have to have a clear test. You have to, this is science. We need to be able to show that this is better than something else or this is improving on something else. There needs to be a clear comparison. If it's just an investigation into, then it doesn't really work. Again, right? It needs to be something that actually says, we're comparing this to this and that's why we think this is an, a, a novel way of doing it or a better way of doing it or it's a different way or we're finding different results or, so it needs to be a contrast. There needs to be a contrast in your objective. And then finally, it, you need to be able, and so again, but coming back to this global content significance, let me show you another paper, and it's full of, uh, full of notes, full of uh, comments from me. So you can ignore that. Where's my mouse? Oh, I've got to come here. This way, here we go. All right, so introduction. This paper summarizes the overall technical assessment of a 168 hectare water farm or artificial recharge pilot located blah, 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 blah. So he says it's a pilot project, the water farm, and then he straight away goes into kind of methods. So he hasn't told me at all why this is important, why this is an important research, why it's globally, why we should be thinking about it, what other research has been going on. Clearly what this is is a consultancy report which he then basically reformatted to fit the journal's requirements and send it in. So, you know, I'm afraid that paper got rejected as well. So, so if you're saying, you know, why do so many people paper get rejected? Well, this is what we get a lot, right? So you need to think about that. That's not a paper, right? You probably all know that, but I'm just pointing this out that there are these examples. Here's some other ones. The aim of the current study is twofold, namely one, to investigate the suitability of parameterization of the regional scale, two, to provide guidance on how to select the parameters, select parameters that will perform well for all catchment in the region. Right? So it's all about region. It's regionally, it doesn't say anything about 
why this is different from what someone else has been doing. It just says we're just looking at, we're, it's an investigation into, right? It's not a contrast, right? And so they're looking at things, they're doing things. Okay, the next one. The objective of this study is to develop a modeling approach to quantify the effects of uncertainty in AWC on agronomic model predictions according to the crop climate and soil. So it's a very brief one, but it's actually reasonable, right? So you can say it's a methodology, it's a modeling approach, and probably if they have done, the only thing that I'm missing here again is the contrast. It doesn't say why is this better than something else, right? It doesn't say the objective is to improve on the existing or to improve on modeling approaches in that area or to identify to because you know things that they actually can say that they they have done differently okay here's another one in this contribution we explore the er erosion and cec coastal database example towards so that's a quite a long one they have a large number of sites the only thing that i was not happy with this one i didn't like was they talk about However, although a particular attention has been given to data quality control in the projection, we, some changes may actually reflect errors or inconsistent during the process of data collection aggregation. Here, our prime approach primarily raises the need of research. Well, is that really a paper or should that be a review paper? You know, is that, a, you know, is that really a research paper? Anyway, it's another really thing. And we got two fourth year theses thesis, which are just reviewed. So this is our fourth year agronomy students. This report endeavors, I don't like endeavors, I wouldn't use that, to address the unknown limitations. Okay, so there are some limitations surrounding, and it was whole grain yields that he was looking in in rice. Whole grain yield management using historical data, providing practical results for the use in multiple stages, stages of the supply chain. Well, that sentence is too long. Initial analysis of the variables, both blah, 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 what's easy, growing control, understanding the factors that affect, okay, I can see that. So we need an improved understanding of the factors that affect whole grain yields. And then he says he, the goal is to model the effect. And then, but then he talks about, you know, so that one's a bit vague. The second one is this project aims to compare different methods. Okay, that's good. It's comparing different methods. So there's a test of estimating soil moisture status within the irrigated costing system. Okay, that, that makes sense. He's comparing things. Four different technology methodologies are studied and compared, and then he explains what those are. So that, to me, that's a, better, that's a better objective, right? It's clear comparison, there's something there. Okay, all right. So getting the getting introduction, the objectives, and the hypothesis right is, is really important, and getting that, making it clear, that's really important to, to try and get that done. Okay, then when you get to the methods, they have to be crystal clear. I mean, there's too many papers that I go through. I go, I have no idea what this person has been doing, or they make decisions in there, or there are um, so whether people making uh, arbitrary decisions, or whether people making uh, not writing fully down what they actually done. They just make uh, assumptions that they don't qualify. So the key thing that we're trying to talk about in method is that it is repeatability, right? Someone else needs to be able to take your paper, repeat your research, and get your results. Now that's hard enough because we know that, that that isn't true and that doesn't always happen, but that is the goal, right? So your, your description of your experiment or whatever you've done has to be so clear that someone else should be able to do this. And so it also needs full disclosure of all the data. Where did you get the data? How did you collect the data? What data do you have? And where can we find the data? Or can someone access the data so they can actually repeat your experiment? You need to describe all the sources of the data and it can be a subheading, that's not a problem. Then the other thing I can't hammer too much about is statistics. Statistics, statistics, and statistics, right? We're in science. If you can't do your statistics, something is wrong. You need to be able to do that right. You need to be able to understand validity. You need to be able to understand transformation, whether you need to transform your data, right? Why do you transform data? Because there's assumptions in your modeling, right? And the assumptions are that your model residuals are normally distributed with mean zero, unless you have another assumption and you need to write that down, right? But the original normal assumption is, okay. I asked my second year geoscience students who I had a, taught a class and I was very disappointed in their response. So I teach different groups. I teach the agronomy students and I teach the uh, geoscience students. I taught the geoscience students, asked them in their second year, second semester, so this is their fourth semester of their study, asked them to do on their 
practical to do some uh, regression and to provide the statistical parameters on the linear regression that they have to do. The best I got was an R-squared calculated in Excel in five decimal places, right? If I had asked my agronomy students, I would have got full p-values, significance of the model, output of statistics. So I, I was pretty proud of my agronomy students because they would do that right. Anyway, so statistics is really important. You need to make sure you do it right. And if you're not sure about the statistics, ask some advice from someone. You know, go and tell them what you've done. It's really good to go and see a statistician and say, I've tried this, I've got this far, this is what I've got. I just want, to, want you to have a look at it and, and to advise me whether I've done it wrong or whether I've got, missed something. That's better than going, here's my data, can you do my statistics for me? It's better if you try yourself first. You need to be able to do this. Right, so tests and comparisons. Make sure that you clearly test, do a test that includes all the variability or you need to describe the assumptions. So if you have a lot of variability, you can't capture that all within your tests, then you need to say, I am assuming that X, Y, and Z does not have much influence on my results. Or we are, is unknown variability that will be included within the error of the system, that you, the, the error of the final test that we actually don't know, we can't define. So what variables are controlled and which variables could not be controlled? And what, how does that influence your results? So by, bad examples and methods I've seen is they use model output to do something else, right? And they, but they're not reporting the model performance, right? So they, they just say, we, we use this model output, and then you go, yeah, well, how did you develop that model? What's in the model? Not using independent data, predicting one model from another model. I've seen that as well, you know? It's not very good. Again, results. You need to do full disclosure. If you leave out results, you need to explain, explain why. Right? You can't just say, oh, I've done all these experiments and your methods, and then you present only half of it. It doesn't work. You need to make clear graphs, font and label size, important point sizes. If, if the reviewer can't see your figures or don't understand your figures, you've got no hope. Right? It doesn't go anywhere. So you need to think about what's the best graph to present your data. I've seen too many times that you know, people just make graphs and graphs and figures and figures and figures, and they're really not the best way. They could have been summarized in a much smarter way within one figure, or they could have used a different type of figure, or you know, do you need a box plot or a bar graph? And that's the same with tables. Don't make, just make tables. If you can do it in a box plot, it's much more visual, and people are much more able to see what actually the results are. So thinking about figures, actually, you need to spend quite a bit of time actually thinking about what is the right figure to present my data. And so how many do you need? Well. I think any paper that has more than about seven figures really should not be published. It's just too many. You know, there must be smarter ways of presenting that same result. So when I get a paper with, you know, 15 figures, I always go, well, at least, you know, eight of those should go. And tables, same thing. You just don't want endless tables. Appendices, other ways of presenting data, you can work it out a different way. Just people are not going to read your article if it's full of lots and lots of stuff that they can't actually make sense of. Unless it's a very, very important, very, very long paper, which I have seen. But in most cases, you know, six or seven figures is probably the maximum you want to go for. So you also need to define what actually is results and what is discussion. That is a difficult thing. I found that the hardest thing to try and understand well, to try and make sure that you it's better to write a results section and a discussion section than to write results and discussion. There are cases where you really can't avoid having results and discussion together, but in most cases in science, it's much better to have a results section separate from the discussion section to keep those two things. And then use subheadings to make sure it breaks up. So here we are, here's a quiz. What's wrong with this figure? Well, first thing, the forms and the labels are too small, right? You can't actually see what's going on there, <laughs> right? No idea. The title is not very informative, right? It doesn't tell me anything. And so why is it a, why is it a curved line? Right, why, why, why should it be a curved line? Right, should it be a straight line maybe and, you know, regression, so, you know, if you're fitting a non 
if you're not using a linear linear model, you need to explain, or if you do fit, even if you use a linear model, you need to explain what the assumption is, why you think it is linear or nonlinear. There's no problem with this nonlinear model if he would explain in the in the heading, because remember, figures need to be able to stand on by themselves. You need to be able to interpret a figure without the text. So you need to be able in, in your so your figure heading needs to be very informative, and the, in, in, the the information in the figure needs to be good enough that you can actually look at the figure and interpret it without actually having to read the text. So in this case, you need to say something about what the assumption is of why there's a curved line. And there's no reason why that couldn't be a curved line. That's okay, but it just it needs to be a, a discussion about it. All right, and what's wrong with this table? Well, there's two things wrong. One is, of course, decimal places, right? I'm sure that his data weren't that accurate that he actually could produce, what is it, six decimal places on his R squared, right? Clearly, Excel is a is a lovely a lovely tool, but you've got to be careful in what you present from it, right? The other thing is, are any of these R squared significant? Probably not, right? So probably there are actually no there is no relationship because, you know, unless you've got lots and lots and lots of data, an R squared of point one is unlikely to be significant. So the significance of your, of your relationship is important to try and test. So clearly, you know, results, this is out of a fourth year thesis, so, you know, this agronomy student clearly didn't pay attention in statistics. Okay. So then you get to the discussion. So the discussion is really important too. It's, import it's kind of your closing message to the reviewer as well, or to the reader. But also, in, you can also think about this to the reviewer, right? This is your closing message. This is really where you want to make your point. This is where you want to say, all right, looking back at my objectives, right, these, the, and looking at my results, these, these are the things that I've done. And you can then have a critical analysis. What actually went wrong? What could be done better? But you can also talk about the positives. So don't be too negative, right? You need to, but you need to be realistic. What did you not control for? What really are the things that you can compare it to? How, you know, how does it, does it, where does it sit? How does your outcome fit with the existing research? Research, right? Can you reference it and explain why? I, I had a paper I wasn't going to show there. Maybe I can find it. Just a second. Uh, sorry, I can't. I can't. Can't remember which one I was trying to identify. So I'll just leave that for now. But I think I think one one of the things that people forget. Uh, actually, I was just I was just looking at another review um, paper that was getting back from the reviewers, and the original paper had a discussion. There was no reference in the discussion. Now you can over reference, but in this case, the discussion there was a lot of discussion, so it was like two pages of discussion but there was no, not one citation of another paper in there. And I mean, if you're trying to fit your outcomes with existing research, then really that's what you need to do, right? You need to have citing other papers and saying, well, these people have found this, and we've done this, and this is how. And again, you come back to this introduction. You come back basically to your introduction story. You're saying, so we have shown you know, that we've done something better or that we've done something different. And that's, you know, we, how does your study move the existing research forward? Right? Is it just... A repeat, or are we actually making some progress here? Because in the end, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to move science forward. We're trying to get to the next level, right? And it can be summarizing, and it can also be slightly speculative. So you can actually talk about what you believe that is happening, or what you think that might be happening, or you think that in the future might be happening. You can actually put that in, if it's well underpinned by what you found. Don't go too far, right? <laughs> I've seen, seen examples of that as well. But in general, you can be slightly speculative. 
again, use good subheadings. It will help, you know, breaking up the story, making sure that it's clear what you're talking about and se separating things out. All right. So then finally we get to the conclusions. The important thing is be brief. Um, two pages of conclusions is not good, right? It's a couple of paragraphs, two maximum, I would say. You want to link back to the objectives. This was my objective. This is how I actually proven that objectives. You need to outline the main findings, but you don't want to speculate in this case. That's in the discussion, so leave that out. Too many times, you know, people continue to speculate in the conclusions while that really should have been in the discussion. So brief, brief is important, keeping it very brief. So, yes. So, but I think, so in terms of rejections, the papers that are, the most, most pa papers that I reject are either in, so the, the, the three big sections to me are introduction, methods, and results. If those three don't stack up, then the paper gets rejected. If the discussion is flawed, I'll go for major review, right? I'm happy to put that in. If I think the results are really interesting and there's, they actually done a good job of describing that, then, the, then I go for major review. But if, if, the, if, if they are not clear introduction what they're trying to do or the introduction is not clear enough about whether this is actually something really new, then it gets rejected. If the, result, if the methods are incomplete and I can't understand what they actually have done, then the paper gets rejected. If the results are incomplete or the results are just badly presented or things like that, maybe that will be a major review. Depends a bit on how good the other bits are. But really, so interaction and methods are really important and results. Those three things are really the most important bits. The rest, you know, we can live with. We can do reviews on. So um, I use uh, a reference manager, you know, I use Zotero and EndNote to uh, work with, uh, and probably all of you already do, I just can't, I, if you're not, you should be doing it, right? Because it really makes things easier and you don't make mistakes. And Zotero is a free program, EndNote of course is a, is a paid program, there's a couple other paid programs that you can use. You can use Mendeley on, uh, now on, uh, on Elsevier as well. So there's a couple other ways you can use this and you can use them site as you write within all the different word processing programs, they all have that. And it makes just the whole referencing so, so much less painful than when you have to do that all by hand. You really should be doing that. Um, I had another paper I wanted to show, but it's on my laptop and not on this computer. So the other thing is a lot of people, some people like to oversight. So they go, they go and they make this sentence, they say they make a statement and then there's like four or five references behind it. Now, really that's not needed. If you're trying to make a point in introduction, you can just use one or two papers. Use just the key papers, right? Unless there's contrast and you have a discussion, then you might say, you know, you might cite more papers. But if it just all the papers agree, then you can just cite the latest or the latest few, right? You don't have to cite the, the or you cite the, the real important paper, the one that everybody cites. Make sure you've actually read the paper. Too many mistakes have been made. <laughs> where people actually haven't read the paper and they're citing what someone else is saying who also hasn't read the paper. I think there was is one example about, was it the paper? I think it's a paper from the soul physicist J.R. Philip that got misquoted, you know, um, something like a, a hundred times in a row, like by people just following each other. <laughs> it's quite a, quite a good example. So, you know, so, you know, make sure you actually read the paper. Don't just cite because other people cite this paper. You actually and read, this, read it. And, and it just masks lazy review, you know? If you just put all those references in, you're just trying to, you know, impress someone, it really doesn't help. And you can just use EG or, you know, for example, and you just use one paper, right? You don't have to use all of them um, if there are many other papers in that same area. And finding a good review paper, of course, helps with that. All right, so then your reviews come back. So you gotta remember that in the end, the reviews of your paper are feedback. So if you get reviews back that are negative, that is still feedback. You, just, you still have to take that as feedback. It just means you have to do a better job. And so if, if it got rejected, it's okay to be upset for a little while. That's okay, right? I've got three rejected papers that I'm, I'm rewriting it myself. So, you know, it happens to all of us. It's not something that is just you, right? And they don't really hate you, no. They really just trying to give you some feedback that this is not the way to write that paper. You might have to do it differently. So you need to analyze the, the comments. And you need to look at 
Were you clear enough? And it doesn't mean that there aren't bad reviews. There is sometimes a reviewer who just does a bad job. I've had a two-line comment from someone rejecting a paper. That's not helpful, right? It's just, I don't know what I've done wrong. It just, he doesn't like my paper, but he doesn't tell me why. So it's not very useful. So if you get good reviews, even though they're extensive and they reject your paper, then at least you've got extensive feedback. Go and read all the comments. Try and do something about it. And then try and resubmit it to maybe another journal or resubmit it to the journal if it allows you. So one outcome is reject and allow to resubmit, right? So that's one thing you can think about. Um, <clears throat> so you need to look at the comments. Were you clear enough? Did you present it well enough? Did you choose the right audience journal? Maybe you just chose the wrong journal. Maybe that's not the journal where you're supposed to go, right? Because people, you don't get the reviewers that, that, that relate to that. Did you choose the right keywords? So how do I find reviewers? I type the keywords in my reviewer search tool, and then I try to read the abstract, and then with those, I find the reviewers. And those reviewers, if you didn't provide the right keywords or the title is not informative, I'm going to get different reviewers. Okay. Ask also the... Um, a colleague to read your paper and give you frank reviews, right? A colleague can be really useful just to look at it. So finally, reviewing can make you a better author. So please volunteer to review. When you get this re request for review in your inbox, say yes, right? Because it actually makes you a better author. Reading other people's work helps you identify flaws in your own work, right? And the last thing I want to say, you can get recognized for all your reviews now. This is this free website, Publons. So this is an open source um, activity. And here's my profile. So you can put onto Publons, you can get onto that, that um, and you know, it tells you what, you're, what you've done in terms of uh, reviews. It tells you... Um, what your uh, editorial board membership or whatever you're doing that as well and how many manuscripts you... So you can actually get a... And you can get a report from that and you can add it to your next promotion application, right? Or your next job, job ad, uh, application because you actually can get a recognition for what you've done in that. So it's not... People are trying to make it better and Scope has got the same thing. You know, there's a couple other... This is an open source one, so that's the reason why I support it. Um, but yeah, so there's many different ways of doing this kind of thing. Okay, that's all I had. Okay, mucha, mucha, thank you very much, William. Muchas gracias, William. En, para los que nos están siguiendo por el streaming, eh, apareció un número de teléfono por si algunos nos quieren hacer llegar a través de WhatsApp alguna, alguna pregunta. La idea es a, a lo último, si tenemos tiempo, poder, poder transmitirle a los, a los expositores este, alguna, seleccionar alguna de ellas. Así que ahora, ahora seguiríamos entonces con la, con la presentación de Marco Dalarriza y luego haríamos este, la articulación con la audiencia. Bien, buenos días. Gracias por la invitación a, a hacer esta presentación de Agrociencia. Yo agradezco también la presentación de Willem, me pareció excelente. Nosotros hemos hecho desde Agrociencia también algunos cursos que traten de ayudar, que nos trate de ayudar, me incluyo en, la, en, en el taller que se hicieron acá en Agrociencia, para aprender a escribir eh, un artículo científico. Se ha hecho curso de redacción científica y también taller de redacción científica, o sea, a partir de la experiencia de tener un manuscrito, discutirlos, algunos de los que están en la audiencia los han hecho, y muchas de las, de los, las sugerencias que nos ha hecho Willem han sido discutidos en estos cursos y hemos aprendido también a cómo presentar eh, un manuscrito a una, a una revista. ¿no? Y muchas de las, de las sugerencias que hizo Willem son discutidas, este, sobre todo cuando uno escribe eh, un manuscrito como parte de un trabajo, de un proceso de investigación, donde uno resume lo que avanzó, lo que, 
lo que concluyó, qué es nuevo, cómo poder escribirlo, eh, eh, también eh, verificar en un manuscrito el rigor científico, o sea, las tres R que nos enseñaron entre la relación que tiene que haber entre el título y el objetivo del trabajo, el respaldo que tiene que haber entre el resultado y la metodología y la respuesta que hay entre el objetivo este, y las conclusiones de nuestro trabajo, todas esas cosas que nos ayudan a escribir de manera correcta un manuscrito, eh, tratamos de, de apoyarlo desde Agrociencia para que es una, una, un, uno de los aprendizajes que hacemos en la investigación y que también a, eh, como, como investigadores o como también tutores de, de estudiantes de, de posgrado, eh, decimos de que un trabajo no está terminado hasta que no se publica. Es parte esencial que concluye muchas veces y le da un un lugar a la investigación que hacemos y por supuesto que tratar de eh, hacerlo en, en, en revistas que, que son eh, arbitradas, este, que tienen revisores por pares y todas estas sugerencias que nos hizo de cómo aprender de, de, de las devoluciones que tenemos a los manuscritos que presentamos, aprendemos y, y tratamos de incorporar eh, las sugerencias o en, en en nuestros trabajos. De modo que eh, muchas gracias, Willem, por la presentación. Es algo que nosotros desde Agrociencia tratamos de impulsar para, para aprender este, y también para valorizar lo que les vamos a presentar ahora, que es eh, nuestra revista de la Agrociencia Uruguay, eh, que, que bien eh, es, eh, desde, está desde 1997 como una iniciativa de la Facultad de Agronomía. Eh, inicialmente con un volumen eh, por año eh, y luego eh, pasó a dos números por año. En el 2007 eh, viene coeditada con, con, entre la Facultad de Agronomía y el INIA eh, y tratamos de, de, que, de estimular la, la, y usar esta revista como una forma de eh, publicar nuestras investigaciones en, eh, que se hacen a nivel eh, de Uruguay, eh, aprovechando la, la, las facilidades que tenemos. Bien, eh, yo quería esta mañana un poco agradecer la presentación porque estamos haciendo, sugiriendo algunos cambios que se van a visibilizar eh, a partir del próximo número. Eh, bien, respeté algo que no, que no corresponde. Eh, decirles que Agrociencia Uruguay está indexada en, en estos... Eh, acá en, esta, en estas eh, bases de datos, en, en CAPI, en Latindex, Cielo, Web of Science, eh, DOAG, este, y, y también recibimos este, una iniciativa de Scopus para ser indexada acá. Así que eh, estamos tratando de mantener periódicamente siempre dos números por año y, en, y más o menos hasta ahora se han tenido entre 14 y 15 publicaciones. Eh, Bien, acá tienen un poco, Milka Ferrer y yo estamos en, en, por este periodo eh, como editores en jefe de la revista y luego hay un, un cuerpo editorial eh, que abarca siete eh, áreas eh, de la revista y que son eh, biotecnología microbiana y de plantas. Acá tienen los editores que son eh, compartidos entre la Facultad de Agronomía y el INIA, eh, producción de plantas, protección, eh, recursos naturales y ambiente, eh, pasturas y forraje, producción animal y forrajes, eh, ciencias sociales y economía agraria, eh, un área nueva que estamos incorporando a partir del número que viene, que es tecnología de alimentos, eh, y también mmm, dando un espacio a eh, publicar resúmenes de los, de los doctorados que se están haciendo en el país y que se, se están incorporando, se están realizando en la Facultad de Agronomía, también aceptaremos de otras, de otras eh, universidades, de otras facultades. Bien, todo este trabajo, eh, como decía eh, Willem anteriormente, es voluntario y por lo tanto tratamos de reforzar con mayor número de, de editores en aquellas áreas donde la revista recibe más eh, manuscritos a ser evaluados, de manera de, hacerlo más, de hacerle un seguimiento más sencillo. Bien, hay todo una, acá tienen todo el elenco de la gente que está trabajando y unas 40 personas trabajando en esta, en esta revista. 
Bien, también tenemos un consejo asesor eh, de, de, requerido por, por algunas, eh, para ser indizados en algunas de las bases de datos que les mencioné anteriormente. Muchos de ellos son este, eh, gente que trabaja, interacciona con, con proyectos de investigación de la facultad o de INIA, o son mismos, eh, eh, muchos de ellos son uruguayos que están trabajando en el exterior o en el, o en el país. Eh, bien, y hemos recibido algunos desafíos, como eh, leen acá, que es incrementar el impacto de la revista, expandir la visibilidad del, de, de, de agrociencia y acortar los tiempos de publicación. Entonces, acá ven que nos mencionaba las métricas, eh, Willem, y, y nosotros tenemos un, un, un factor de impacto bastante bajo comparado con las revistas, otras peristas, revistas similares como... Acta Agronómica de Colombia, este, y bueno, esta es un área que nosotros queremos impulsar a través de algunas sugerencias que estamos sometiendo a, a, al Consejo de la Facultad de Agronomía y al Comité de Investigación de IÑA. Entonces, estamos proponiendo algunas acciones para cambiar, eh, y bueno, resaltar de que esta es un, una revista de acceso libre eh, que trata sobre todo temas, eh, mencionaba Willem también, temas locales este, que pueden ser no atractivos para otras este, revistas internacionales. Eh, estamos cambiando la modalidad y a partir del próximo número eh, los, escritos van a, los, las, los manuscritos vamos a cambiar, el, el, el lenguaje oficial de la revista va a ser inglés y para esto este, la INIA y la Facultad de Agronomía apoyan, la, la, los, los, los manuscritos van a ser aceptados en español o en inglés y eh, de manera de tener una buena corrección de estilo inglés, para nosotros nos cuesta escribir, este, vamos a tener una corrección de estilo, ya tenemos un, un panel de revisores eh, de, en inglés y por lo tanto hasta 5.000 palabras lo va a asumir la revista, y si luego hasta 7.000, que son el, el número de palabras por artículo que está estipulado en la revista, eh, esos 2.000 palabras, o lo que exceda las 5.000, va a ser pago por, el, por los autores. Entonces este es un cambio grande, lo que estamos buscando es darle mayor eh, difusión a la revista, eh, y, y entonces eh, las instituciones apoyan este cambio. Eh, apostar a una mejor calidad y relevancia de los artículos, acortar los tiempos de publicación, este, y el objetivo estamos proponiendo que sea en seis meses, desde que se reciben hasta que se acepta el artículo y sale a, 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 a publicación. Eh, la revista deja de ser, eh, va a tener, no va a tener más este, publicación en papel, va a ser versión electrónica de acceso libre y bueno, este, y entonces este va a ser eh, todo en, en online. Bien, acá tienen un esquema del proceso de, de editorial de, de la revista. Eh, como mencionaba también Willen anteriormente, bueno, eh, tenemos un, un comité editor, que yo les, un cuerpo editor que les mostré anteriormente, que deben asignar los, los revisores. Y acá tienen los plazos que tienen los revisores para contestar, luego para confirmar que aceptan la, la... Esto es para asignar los revisores, el tiempo que tienen para contestar si aceptan o no la revisión. Eh, luego, 13, cuatro semanas para, para tener un informe de los revisores. Y acá empieza todo el... el, el una vez que se toma una resolución, todo el proceso posterior que va... Eh, desde hacer los cambios de, de las sugerencias que reciba el, el manuscrito hasta todo el proceso de edición que lleva también y tratamos tratando de que este tiempo se cumpla en los seis meses. Bien, estos son los cambios principales que estamos presentando para la revista eh, y, y que van a empezar a correr eh, con, el número, con el próximo número de 2019, ya el, el el, tenemos el número de artículos, más o menos vamos a estar rondeando los 12 artículos por número, 24 por año, este, y, y son los cambios que estamos proponiendo para la revista. Bien, yo lo que quería era agradecer este, la presentación de esta mañana, que nos venía muy buena para eh, mejorar nuestros manuscritos eh, y difundir 
la, esta, esta, nuestra revista que se hace entre la Facultad de Agronomía y el INEA como modo de apoyar también los estudios de, de, de investigación que se hace de acá a nivel nacional y también de posgrado, o sea, eh, también que se visualice como una forma de publicar nuestros trabajos eh, que se hacen en, en el país. Bien, eso era lo que tenía para presentar. Bueno, estamos, estamos perfectos en el tiempo, tenemos, tenemos por lo menos 15 minutos más para relevar algunas, algunas preguntas antes, antes de ir a la sala, porque seguramente también puede haber alguna pregunta acá. Este, por ahora este, nos, han llegado, nos han llegado dos... A ver cómo puedo... Ahora aquí... Bueno, una tiene que ver con tener disponible la presentación de... De Willen, entiendo que en, en el YouTube va a quedar va a quedar filmado y además nosotros tenemos la presentación que la podemos que la podemos este, la podemos compartir y luego hay, hay una hay una reflexión y una pregunta que de alguna manera ya se la transmití a Willen la leo el señor Willen indicó algunas preguntas que debería formularse para ver si el artículo es publicable entendí dos puntos por qué es necesario el estudio ¿Estoy seguro que estoy brindando algo nuevo? ¿Cómo mejora mi resultado lo, lo que ya existe? ¿No repito lo ya hecho? Entonces le consulto, esta es la consulta, y es una opinión, si no serían más o menos las mismas preguntas que debería formularse un investigador cuando formula el proyecto y solicita recursos. Gracias por su aporte. Sí. So, Willen, if you want to comment on that. Sí. Sí. Okay. <laughs> And that's it. Yes, yeah. it. Okay. Uh, the only the only difference is um, yeah, maybe I'm okay. Okay. the only difference is that in a project proposal, of course, you don't need to present um, results and analysis. So, although you might show some previous results, and you better make sure they're correct. Um, yeah, the article, the other important thing is, of course, how you present the results and whether the results are presented correctly and uh, analyzed correctly. That's the only difference, I think. But the initial part, yes, the, uh, in describing of the methods and the describing of the introduction and the objectives and the importance of why you need to do this research, that's exactly the same as what you would do when you write a project to get some money. Gracias, William. ¿Alguna pregunta o algún comentario aquí en sala? Para tanto para Marcos como para William. William, ¿you want to say something? No, pero pregunta por, por Marcos. Ya, yeah, pregunta. Ah, para Marcos. Ok. Um, uh, ¿Es posible de publicar los datos con un artículo en uh, agrociencia? ¿Es posible to, to also publish the data? So the actual, so the actual have the make the data actually available with the paper in like an, an extra repository, like a CSV file, and also in terms of modeling that I'm in, is it possible to also provide? Can you also publish the code, like computer code, with your article, and you have a repository for that? Nosotros. <laughs> Tenemos, en, en el artículo se publica todos los datos que están. No hay datos suplementarios por ahora en la revista. Muchas veces en otras revistas hay posibilidades de poner datos suplementarios donde uno pone este, rela, eh, datos inform que, que son relativos a, a lo que hace al texto, pero que se extienden en, en suplementos. Entonces ahí uno pone eh, trabajos que, que sostienen lo que uno comunica en el, en el, en el texto. Esa posibilidad todavía no, nosotros publicamos lo que el, 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 el artículo, el manuscrito tiene que tener todo el contenido este, eh, presente en el artículo. ¿Está bien? No sé si respondo la... ¿Está bien? Bueno, si no hay... Si, ¿A qué? Thanks for your presentation. Just a comment about um, 
graphical abstractors or figures like that. I, 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 th I don't know if you have some idea of the impact of that, is, is useful. Maybe you, you, you talk about all other kind of data or CSV files or something like that. You, you, do you think, I guess, it's, it's important to, to communicate, but in fact, for a graphical abstract, do you, do you have some experience or comments? Um, I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm personally, I'm not totally convinced about the highlights graphical abstract. It's, it's, I think it's useful if you're um, considering promoting your article via Twitter or um, something like that, then it's kind of useful because it gives you a snapshot of the paper and it gives you an image with it. Um, in terms of the journal itself or on the website or things like that, I f don't find the graphical abstract or even the highlights fairly f very informative. I generally read the abstract uh, before I read those things. Um, but I think, yeah, and I think mainly it's for social media. So in terms of social media, and that's something, you know, agrocentias can also consider whether you do that to promote the use of social media. And social media is really powerful in terms of uh, promoting articles. Um, in, in, and it can be really helpful um, to use. It's just, yeah, social media has got these, you know, it's got two sides. It's you know, it all depends on how you manage it and how you use it, and it can be can be really useful, and it can, but you can also provide an overload, and you need to be careful with that. Alguna otra pregunta o comentario? Si no, este, le agradecemos a Willem y a Marcos por el por el tiempo y la dedicación a este taller. Muchísimas gracias. Le damos un aplauso.